Raise Reviews, welcome back. Check this out, I got a very interesting uh, review for you today. This is the Meyer Gorlitz Trioplan 50mm 2.9 lens. And back in the day, this lens is very old. It, I think this was made in the 50s. Um, and back then, this was a standard lens on the film cameras of the day, of course. But over the years, what it was discovered was this particular lens has a unique character. When the aperture is wide open, and you're focusing on something close and there's highlights in the background. The highlights in the background have this bubbly character to them. They look just like soap bubbles and it's very unique, it's very beautiful. Um, and because of that, these lenses have been brought back. And, and something happened that I've never seen before. Of all the popular iconic lenses from the past, this is the one that was chosen to be revived and remanufactured in modern form um, and that's very unique so I have the old school version of course and if you're looking for information on this lens there's not a lot of reviews of it out there and I wanted to make a thorough one myself as I always do so if you're curious interested about this particular lens stick around I'm gonna be checking out the Meyer Gorlitz Trioplan 50 millimeter 2.9 stay tuned You know, in the United States, Meyer Optic is not a well-known camera brand. It's a German company, and they've been around a long time. They were founded in 1896, and they were so successful that they were producing much of the lenses for the major German camera manufacturers at the time. At one point, they were so successful, they were producing over 100,000 lenses per year. One of their most popular lenses was a trial plan. Okay, check this out. This is Soap Bubble 101. I'm going to show you a perfect conditions to get soap bubbles. For right now, the sun is out. It's perfectly bright in the sky. Right now we have some branches here and there's some pond water. Uh, some people may call it pond scum. And it's down there glistening. So this is the perfect condition. So because you have foreground to focus on, glistening in the background to create the bubbles, and that nice bright light. If the clouds were to cover the sun, the bubbles would disappear. If it was an overcast day, the bubbles would disappear. So it's a, it's a kind of critical thing. So uh, check this out. All right, I'm gonna show you something cool that a lot of people don't know about. When we think about the soap bubble effect, the first and only lens that come to mind is a trial plan. But what a lot of people don't know, there's a lot of other lenses that do the same thing. For example, this is the Jupiter 8. It's a Soviet 50 millimeter lens. And I had this lens a few months before I got the trial plan. And I accidentally stumbled on the fact that it also does the soap bubble effect. And matter of fact, it's so similar there's times when I can't tell the difference of which, um, which lens I use when I took a particular photo. Uh, there are differences though with it and the trial plan. There's pros and cons. So if you're interested in doing photography like this, uh, but you don't want to get the trial plan for whatever reason, uh, just do some research uh, and know that there are other lenses that have the same effect. Okay, so we're back. But there's something I want to talk about. I want to show you the number of aperture blades this trial plan has. It has 12 rounded aperture blades and you may wonder what's the big deal if you're a new photographer but the number of blades is important because for example if you have out of focus highlights the out of focus highlights tend to take on the shape of the aperture blade so if you have many aperture blades rounded and working together the highlights will be perfectly round they will look uniform but as a contrast this is a, a, one of my favorite lenses. This is a Carl Zeiss Pancolor, but it only has six aperture blades. That means the highlights are rarely rounded unless it's wide open. And the problem with then is your highlights are gonna be shaped like an octagon. And I'm gonna show you a picture right now um, of the sun, how it is not round. And that is a big problem and uh, it shouldn't be that way. And I think it's no excuse for Carl Zeiss making a lens to perform that way. Um, 
I, I, I don't know, it's kind of unforgivable in my mind, but that's why I really appreciate this, um, the trial plan, because when you use a, a lens like this, you're trying to be artistic, and the out of focus areas are a big part of that. So uh, the smoother they are, the better it's going to be. And one thing you're going to notice is a lot of the older lenses had a large number of blades, whereas modern lenses have kind of br brought it back down for some reason. I don't know if it's cost of manufacturing or what, but uh, it is important the more rounded blades you have, the smoother your background is going to be. Okay, there's something I want to point out uh, about this lens. And whenever you hear people talk about the trial plan, it seems like, the only thing they talk about is the soap bubbles and I think the lens gets criticized for that a lot because a lot of people say that's the only thing it's good for but uh, what people fail to realize is that this lens wasn't designed for soap bubbles um, when it was designed it was meant to be a normal everyday lens to walk around with on your film camera the soap bubbles is just an anomaly or imperfection in the lens design and um, so a person may have this lens and and may only use it every few months because they don't have the conditions to get those soap bubbles. But um, what I recommend you do is take this lens, put it on your camera and walk around with it all day long. Don't change it. Uh, what I do is I may put it to F4, put my camera in aperture priority and just, just shoot. Forget about the lens limitations. Just shoot what you can within the limitations. And I think what'll happen is when you get home, run it through your computer uh, you may be pleasantly surprised at how good the images is, how clear and, and unique they look. Matter of fact, if you're shooting vintage, I recommend getting an adapter and putting it on your film camera. You can even put black and white film in it. And if there's no iPhone in the photo, folks may not even know that it wasn't shot 50, 60 years ago. Um, so that's something I recommend people do is don't focus on just the soap bubbles. That's just one aspect of it. If you have this lens treated as a normal lens and, and you're definitely gonna get some uh, good results. For example, if someone looks at your photo and they may say, wow, they see the only reason you're able to take these great photos is because you got all this epic gear. And then you can tell them, hey, no, that, that photo was taken with a 60 year old lens and uh, they're not gonna be able to say anything. So um, that's one cool thing about this lens is um, don't count it out. All right, so right now I am in Key West, Florida. It's a very old and very scenic island in South Florida. It's just recovering from a hurricane. But what I'm here for is I'm testing out the trio plan as well as my Voigtlander Color Ultron. I want to see what they can do in a real world environment. And uh, I'm going to try to do some street photography. I'm not proficient at street photography at all. Uh, I'm very timid, but it is something that I want to get better at. So I'm going to be testing out these lenses, especially the trio plan, to see how it behaves in a real world environment, because that's really what it was meant to do. Stay tuned. push this lens to the limits. Uh, this is the last lens you want to use for street photography, um, especially after you're used to modern fast auto focusing lenses. But when I see how um, photographers back then in the 50s and so were able to get great epic street photography with this lens and a slow film camera, it makes me realize I've got no excuse. One thing about this that slows it down, of course, is the ergonomics. The focus ring is very thin. Um, as well as the aperture ring. And the main issue that I'm having is, for example, if you're using peaking with a modern camera, there may be two people. One may be in front, one may be in behind. The peaking sometimes will highlight both people. And you, you want this one in focus, but after you take the shot and when you look at the image, the one in behind is the one that's actually in sharper focus. So 
um, that's one of the issues I'm having is uh, I recommend if you have time to magnify the image in the camera use the critical focusing before you take that but um, if you're doing street photography you're really not gonna have time to do that you got to be quick so you have no choice but to use the peaking but it's important to know uh, that uh, it's not a very ergonomic lens for street photography <music> show you a couple technical things about this lens specifically why it's not best for video although you can use it the aperture ring uh, does not turn perfectly smooth it has clicks like any normal photography lens but one thing about the clicks they're kind of hard and they're kind of loud hear that uh, the next thing is the focus throw is really long that's a good thing if you're doing photography because you can be very precise but you probably notice as I'm racking focus from near to far, uh, the camera is shaking. It's because as I rotate as far as I can, I have to re-grab and turn some more, and that shakes the camera. Uh, so the video coming out of it, in my opinion, is, is beautiful. It has an artistic look to it, but it is not optimized for video. Show you something even more wild I've been showing you this lens the whole time I'm doing this review but check this out <laughs> I got two trial plans and the, the weird thing is as much as I talk about this lens limitations and I, all the other lenses I have why would I have two of the, the lens with the most limitation it's um well I love the lens for number one but I started out shooting it on a Micro Four Thirds, and uh, the only mount I was able to get the lens in is an old mount called Altix. Very f hard to find an adapter. So um, I got an adapter and I put it on my Lumix, and of course the 50 millimeter lens became a 100 millimeter lens. And then I got into focal reducers for Micro Four Thirds, but the problem is there's no way for me to adapt the Altix lens to the focal reducer. So for over a year, um, I just languished and looked and looked and I finally found someone on eBay who modified their trial plan into M42 mount. So when I saw that, I hurried up and picked it up, bought it. Um, I was the only bidder, which is strange because it's hard to find an M42 trial plan. But so this is the trial plan I've been showing you, the one adapted to micro, I'm sorry, adapted to M42. So that's why I have two trial plans, this old Altix one. I don't know if I'm going to keep it or sell it or, or not, but one of the issues with these lenses is finding a way to adapt them to the camera you have. And that's something I can't fully really help you with because everyone has a different camera mount. So um, I just recommend do a lot of research and make sure that um, especially if you can use it with a focal reducer, you're going to get the best results because much of the character and the edges you'll be able to retain um, on a crop sensor camera. Okay, there's something important I almost forgot to, to mention in this review uh, about the modern history of Meyer Optic. At one point in the past, the company went out of business. They didn't exist anymore. But recently, uh, a company bought the rights to use the name of Meyer Optic. And they actually started a Kickstarter campaign uh, to revive the lenses. And it was very successful. So uh, 
I'm going to put a link to their website below. There's many different Meyer optic lenses from the past that were recreated. Um, but what's controversial about it is, for example, the modern 50 millimeter is about $1,400. And uh, a lot of photographers are saying they wouldn't spend that much on such a narrowly focused art lens when there's more capable art lenses out there. So for that reason, you don't see a lot of people buying it. You don't see a lot of reviews of it. Um, but it's important that I uh, pointed that out, that there is a modern version of this lens available. Uh, check out the website. They have some very interesting historical facts and, um, and photographs from uh, well-known photographers on there using the lenses, though. So it's, it's really cool to check it out either way. Okay, so that concludes my review of the Trioplan 50 millimeter. I really hope this video is like a resource for people looking for information on the lens because like I said there's very few videos detailed explaining uh, the characters of this lens um, so feel free to ask any questions if you have in the comments below I'll answer them to the best of my ability I want to thank you for watching this episode of Ray's Real Reviews and no matter what lens you choose to shoot on as always keep it real